Hello, hello, hello. Ahora, ahora funciona, ahora funciona. Hello, hello. Sí, mira, fíjate, están haciendo. Antes nos estábamos escuchando y yo estaba eso realizando. So, good morning, everyone. We well, had a small technical problem, but now it looks like it is solved. Uh, welcome to the first edition of the summer school. This is a continuation of the winter school that was held here this winter and I would say that without further delays I pass the word to, Sine, to Professor Javier Bonet, CIMNES General Director. So Javier, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much Ricardo. <clears throat> and first of all I want to welcome you all to, to CIMNES. It's, uh, it's great to be able to see so many of you in this room but I am aware that there is also another 50 people that are connected via Zoom. So can I welcome you all, those that are here presentially in the room and those that are joining us uh, virtually. Uh, as Ricardo was saying, my name is Javier Bonet. I'm the new uh, director of PIMNE, the International Center for Numerical Methods in, uh, in Engineering. I've been in this post for less than two months, about uh, a month and a half. But it is a, a real pleasure to be able to open this uh, workshop on machine learning. This is one of the key aims of PIMNE, to be able to provide uh, learning and development for the researchers in PIMNE, to be able to help in your education, to be able to make sure that you are up to date in the new technologies and the new techniques. And machine learning, of course, is one of the areas where there is a huge amount of interest worldwide. So it's great to be able to be here and to be able to spend the whole week trying to learn in depth the details about machine learning. And I'm very, very grateful for Ricardo, to Ricardo for organizing this, but particularly to Alex for, for teaching so comprehensively throughout uh, this week. I am sure that you will all, after this week, we become experts in machine learning. Uh, but obviously, you know, this is all about humans learning, humans learning about machine learning. Uh, perhaps one day, humans will not need to learn and the machines will do the learning for us. And all this uh, type of uh, workshop and setup will not be necessary. But I very much doubt it. I very much doubt it. I think all of us, like humans, will always need to learn about new technologies, new developments. And that's part of why we are in Thibne, to make sure that we continue to generate knowledge, we make sure that we continue to push forward the frontiers of, uh, of knowledge. I don't want to spend any more time. Again, thank you all very much for particip participating in, uh, in these sessions. I very much hope that you will find them informative and enjoyable. And I'd like to pass on the word, the, 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 the word to Eugenio Ñate, who is the PI, the director of the Severo Ochoa program under which this uh, workshop is being organized. And obviously Eugenio is the previous director and the founding director of the uh, Over to you, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Javier. And, and um, good morning and welcome to you all who are sitting here in the room and who are listening from all over the world. We are uh, very happy that this is taking place. Um, in the, uh, from the very very uh, beginning was a center for experimental initiatives uh, and the Severo Ochoa program gave us the chance to experiment with new ideas and uh, both in research and training of researchers. Um, the university carries on regular courses uh, undergraduate, graduate and master courses. There's one on numerical methods in engineering which we support but in Finland we have always tried to really complement those uh, official training uh, activities with more, I would say, innovative training uh, activities. Uh, 
And these are, for instance, courses, specialized courses, like the one we have in computational plasticity that has been held over 35 uh, years, every two years, uh, or the theme seminars that take place every month and the theme coffee shop. Uh, coffee shop. Recording in progress. Um, these last uh, two uh, um, events are part of the Severo Ochoa. The Severo Ochoa uh, is a stamp of quality given by the uh, Spanish government to those centers uh, are considered as excellent in research. This is quite difficult for a center that uh, has a vocation for practical uh, application of research in technology like Thimne. And most of the Severo Ochoa centers focus on scientific topics like uh, uh, medicine, biology, chemistry. And we are the only one that is actually uh, focusing on, on, on engineering, on computational engineering. So as complementary to the research activities, out of which we have hired some 80 researchers, both at postdoc about 20 and pre-doc about 50 or 55 level, and we have these this training activities. I mentioned the coffee shops and the, and the senior seminars, and then we decided to create an academic committee, which is chaired by uh, Ricardo Rossi, Professor Rossi, together with Professor Xavier Martinez, with Lucia Barbu, with uh, Jordi Pons, and with Sergio Slotsnik. They sat uh, and thought two new uh, inventions, which is the uh, winter school, focusing on, on uh, introductory topics to computational engineering, and the summer school. We are in the summer school. We didn't know what, how the response was going to be of both initiatives, but the winter school attracted, within a month notice, about 70 participants. And it was a full success that was, took place last January. And then we launched this summer school again with a very short notice, and we are close to 100. So I congratulate you and thank you very much, this academic committee. Ricardo, please um, uh, pass my uh, congratulations and thanks to the committee. Uh, uh, and uh, well, this is the first part. The second part is the success of the event. This, some winter school was quite successful. And now we have to see how this goes. But we are sure this is going to be very uh, uh, successful again because you have been attracted not only by the name of and the topic that Professor Bonnet was referring as one of the hot topics in computational mechanics, but also by the quality of the, of the teaching team. Professor Alex Ferrer is going to take the burden uh, or the, most of the load of the teaching with his team. I think you're going to introduce them in a minute. Yeah. But, uh, well, but this is the first part. The second part will be uh, that when you leave this uh, summer school, that you will actually be uh, happy and uh, and uh, you will recommend this to an, as an activity for your colleagues for the next years to come. And every year we will think of uh, different topics or so complementary topics. So this is a uh, new, this is an invention, and hopefully this will stay uh, for the years to come as one of the key theme activities. Thank you, Alex, uh, Ricardo. The floor is yours, uh, and good luck to you all and to the lectures. Okay. Thank you, Eugenio. Thank you, Javier. I'm not Delving into the lectures time, I just would like to present Alex, Alex, uh, Professor Alex Ferre, who's well an expert in machine learning, who spent a few years in France in the School of Mathematics, if I'm right, learning about this topic, and who's now lecturing on this in in one of the Sydney school. Nothing. We had the challenge. The challenge was to organize a summer school that was dense, but was also focused on the kind of profile that the present people have. And I hope we managed to. So we will see it through the, the week. Alex, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for coming. <clears throat> Thank you, Ricardo, Javier, and, and Eugenio. Um, let's uh, just one second the, the overview of the of the week uh, of the summer school, just to explain you how is it organized. Uh, the, the the website, the, yes, of the summer school. Okay, so I. I'm Alex Ferrer, yes, I am a professor in a UPC uh, in, in the aeronautical department. I come from engineering. I, I did also aeronautical engineering, so I'm an engineer. Um, I was doing my PhD here in, in Thimne, 
so I know the, the house and the and the center. And then I spent some years doing my postdoc in Paris uh, in optimization and and also in 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 data science and and these things. And I will I will explain how we organize the the topic um, and the course. So the program. Yes. Exactly. Uh, we did a, a small modification in, in the last uh, day. Uh, let me explain you how, how it's organized. So the idea is basically in the mornings, we will try to have more theoretical parts. Uh, so we will start from theoretical parts. So for example, continuous optimization, we will, because machine learning uh, has to do a lot with optimization. Then we will move after the coffee break, we will move to some more practical machine learning uh, topics which will be also in the in the whiteboard okay all these parts will be in the board but this will, will be very theoretical or more theoretical this more practical and then after after the lunch break we will have some uh, more practical um, implementation so we will implement here uh, some algorithms we will see some solutions so we will start from the morning i hope uh, we are fresh or fresh in the morning we will take more uh, top, uh, theoretical parts and we will move to more practical parts during the week okay so this is the way we will do it i will i will be teaching all these parts in the morning and then after the coffee break then uh, antonio who is there uh, is going to to help us with the practical part he will he will do all the the, the in python we will code here in python and the practical sessions and then on friday uh, we have mohammad who will explain us uh, the pins which is an application of uh, machine learning to computational mechanics um, so this is not a very general uh, machine learning course. It's not uh, as a machine learning course that you will find uh, elsewhere. It's a machine learning course with a flavor in computational engineering and computational mechanics. So I hope uh, most of you, you, you are coming from the same uh, community. So I will try to relate all of this with uh, these topics. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, what we are going to do. Then about uh, the way I like to teach and to explore, explore uh, explain things. I like really much that you ask many questions. As questions as you, as you prefer, you can interrupt me during the course. Just uh, raise your hand and, and we speak and we try to, to, to answer the questions. I always say that there is no silly questions. So any question is here perfect. Uh, any question, even any, any question. So I like you can ask anything. And uh, there is no silly question not at all. And also, I will try to in the in the chat people that that you can leave uh, some comments and, and questions. And when I take a small uh, uh, during during the lecture, I will try to to, to see the, the chat and see if we can answer also the questions online. Okay. Okay. So I will start. Okay. So today we will start with uh, continuous optimization, the first lecture. I think. Uh, I think you have it also online, the, the lecture one and lecture two. I, I put it also, I think they, they are already online. I don't know if they I, they have uploaded, but you have the the the, the notes of this and this. This is my are my, my notes, a personal note. Uh, I, I'm sure that there will be plenty of, of mistakes there. I'm sure, but uh, it's my personal note and, and I, I will follow these notes. So maybe it's, it's nice you have it also after the course, you can follow the, this note. Um, I don't know. I, I think, uh, or maybe it's, it's going to be uploaded. Uh, Mar, uh, yes, we can upload it. Yes, 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 no problem. About the references. So, what I like very much of references, I like uh, this, this uh, book of comics optimization. About the optimization, this is the, the book I really like. Is uh, Stephen Boyd and, and Van der Berge the, from Stanford. It's a really good uh, book for me. It's, uh, complete with a lot of examples, also examples of machine learning. So I recommend you if you want to learn optimization, this book is pretty nice. And about machine learning, uh, I typically use this book, Deep Learning, which is also a very well known book in machine learning. Ian Goodfellow, Yusuf Benzio, I know of, of those who know a little about uh, machine learning, you probably will know this, this book. Okay. So this is the book I recommend uh, for, for this. About uh, 
about optimization, I also recommend uh, another book, which is a uh, numerical optimization from Matt Adam, right? Let me, let me write it down. So, okay, let's start. Continuous optimization. So, the first lecture is going to be about optimization because machine learning, uh, in fact, in machine learning, we are trying to all the time solve uh, optimization problems, all the time. So what we want to do is to solve optimization problems. So at the beginning, we need to understand how optimization is working and, and, and the basis of optimization, okay? Um, so it, it's going to be an introduction. I hope uh, online uh, you can see it well, in the, the, the size of the letter, and also in the last uh, row, if you don't see it, just tell me because I have sometimes uh, the habit to write very small. So if you if you don't see it, just raise your hand and tell me, and I do it. Uh, okay. So references. You have uh, it's for optimization, complex optimization. The book is actually you, complex optimization. And then I like also numerical optimization. Just not a lot of price. Okay. This book is more uh, about, um, probably more mathematical, I'm not sure to say it like more mathematical, but convex with a lot of applications. Convexity is very important here. However, in numerical optimization is uh, more about the algorithms, probably. This numerical optimization. Here you can find also algorithms, but here is uh, special numerical optimization. Both of them, they are not uh, really, they are general. So there are some 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 uh, small chapters of, 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 uh, of machine learning, but it's just uh, not the important, the, 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 the main topic. The main topic is optimization, okay? Okay, so let's write uh, what is mat uh, the mathematical problem of optimization. So I will try to use this notation it takes me time to, to have like a same notation for all the course. And usually uh, people in optimization will use theta as a design variable, but I will use theta and usually it's x. I will use theta because in machine learning, sometimes it's theta or w. So I will use theta uh, in a way that doing all the course will have the same notation, okay? But it's not the typical, the typical uh, notation of optimization. So just uh, how we put the problem of optimization, we want to minimize, usually minimize with a point here, or minimize a function that depends on theta, such that we have some constraints, and we will call it fi of theta. Uh, R is smaller or equal than zero, we will put it as here. Later we will have also uh, equality constraints, but we will write it like this, and i is all the uh, inequality constraints that we have to fulfill. So an optimization problem, we say that is optimized when theta uh, reaches the minimum value of f0, and at the same time, it fulfills the constraints. When we speak about fulfilling the constraint, we say that if theta, theta fulfills the constraint, we say that theta is a zero point. It's okay. Similarly, um, we can write the, this problem. Sometimes you, you will find that you, you want to minimize theta that belongs to C, such that it minimizes theta, where C is theta, fi of theta, more than zero. It's a, the similar way of writing it. Sometimes you will find it like this explicitly, the constraints. Sometimes you will find just this, but take care that Z, uh, C is, is, a, is a space where theta must live. It means that theta must fulfill the constraint that is uh, smaller or equal than zero. So it's an, a different way to say the, the same thing, okay? But sometimes you will find it like this, with C and C, you have to spe specify how is C, okay? The, the, the space of or where theta must belong to be the solution of the problem, okay? Sometimes uh, naming, you will find that it's called uh, optimization. Or mathematical problem, I mathematical programming. 
So I will put also here. Uh, I am sharing the screen. Yeah. No. And we, I have to give you the role of. Okay. Later I will I will share the screen. Okay. So my, naming. Sometimes people are calling optimization in general, but you will find it also, and this is an old name, mathematical programming. This is because uh, at some point um, optimization was very specific for linear programming, and they were uh, calling it, it was more about programming, programming in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and people call it also mathematical programming. You will see somewhere mathematical programming and, and operational research. You can see, you can see uh, sometimes here it as it, operational research, but now people are not using this, more or less these this words there. We, we speak about optimization in general, okay? Okay. So let's speak about convex optimization, which is a very important very important, it's a, it's an important concept. So convex optimization, we ask F0 of theta to be convex. And also, we ask C to be convex. So, convex optimization is uh, part of optimization uh, discipline. It's convex. We, uh, that we ask that F0, the cost function, is convex. And that C, which C, you see, is, is, a, is a domain, is also convex. Okay. Let's speak about F0 of theta to be convex. What does it mean to be convex? Probably some of you, you already know, a convex function we say, we, we, we say that F of theta t times theta 0 plus 1 minus t of theta 1 is a smaller or equal than t F of theta 0 plus one minus theta t f of theta one. Okay, for all t, for all t between zero and one, and for all theta zero, theta one. What does it mean? Let's, let's write it and let's try to have the inside of this. So the idea is imagine you have theta zero, you have theta one, you have what we call a convex function. Okay, here we have f of theta zero. Can you see it uh, in the in, in the last? Okay. It's not clear actually. Okay, where in, in uh, I mean, online or or? or? I just to online as well because it's a little bit far from me, but online it's so. It's, it's, it's better. Okay. No, I it's not better. It's not clear. Ah, online is not clear. It's it's. it's uh, like you cannot see it at all. Okay, is it up? Um, but is it just the here the the screen or is it? Uh, or you can have a look at what the, I cannot describe it like this, but this is all. Yes, it's unclear. Um, maybe changing the, the color. I don't know. Here, is it better? Yes, better. I will try to, to, to or let's see in blue. Is it in blue better? Is it better than in gray? Right? Yeah, maybe it's the light. Maybe the lighting of the room, the focus, it seems to be the focus for the light. Ah, that, that, the, 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 the resolution of the website, uh, the webcam. Yeah. Maybe. But blue is better and make it larger. Like larger than blue. Yes. Let's try it larger than blue. Thank you. And if we can now get to your like turn notes, like to have a reference. Yes. Um, could, could you ask them, Matt to have the, my lecture notes uploaded, please? Uh, because I think it's going to be easier. Yes. Okay. F of theta zero. So thank you. Yes. If you don't see it, just say it to me because I, I am speaking. I, I don't know. So 
This is f of theta zero. Okay. I will write this again. F t So what we do is we take a line. This line is t f of theta zero plus one minus t f of theta one. Okay. So you think this is better? Maybe no, 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 it's, no, it's no, not clear. Maybe the other the back can be closer. Maybe it can be or maybe we can the light maybe if we if we no because if we like this line there this one maybe this is better we keep this light and we and we can uh, around there yeah yeah that's okay yeah. Like this? Is it, is it better or is it better? Yeah. Now it's better. Yeah. <laughs> now it's better, much better. Much better? Okay, right. Let, let me see. This is one. Okay. The thing is, they, they go together, so I cannot uh, do one. This left one. No, this, this, this row. And then the open, the other one. Just uh, we, we can just open this one, yes. Okay. And then the other one. I think this is okay, more or less better. Okay. Convex functions. So convex functions is important because you see, you see, uh, we don't speak about the smoothness. So this function uh, should not be smooth necessarily, but we have to be convex. I, 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 I plot a, a, a smooth one. But the, the important thing is that if I take t, t a number between zero and one, okay, and I do a combination of theta zero and theta one, so this t moves between zero and one. If it's zero, we are in theta zero. If it's one, we are in theta one. So anybody in between are here in this domain, okay? So we say that all these points, when are in the function here, are going to be below this line, which is t f of theta zero plus one minus t f of theta one. So if t is one, we will have f of theta zero on the contrary, okay? So we ask for this. This means convexity for a function. As I was, it, it, it is a smooth, but it can be non smooth also. Okay? And in fact, uh, a lot of problems are non smooth and are convex, and we can solve it. Okay? Um, and a convex set, we say that a convex set is very similar. I would like to. To also put here uh, my my notes or my iPad or uh, actually I'm I'm looking for okay. it because they you can already download them so I'm gonna show you. Okay, um, meanwhile, so we are speaking first, we are convex optimization, speaking about convex optimization. We have the function and the set, okay? About the constraints. About the function, we say that the function must be convex. It means that the function should be below this, uh, the, this line, okay? This linear approximation, okay? Then about the convex part, the constraints, what we ask is also convexity. And this is more abstract, more general. And let's see why. This is convex, this, this, this domain is convex. So you can have 
a point which is between zero and one also, you, you draw a line between zero and one, t, you move from theta zero and theta one, so theta, theta zero and theta one should belong to c. So this is theta zero, this is theta one, any, for any theta zero and theta one, when you draw a line and you move with t, it is going to be inside, okay? Non-convex, you can, for example, here, you can have two points that are going to be inside, but you can find two that there will be points in between that are going to be outside the convex area, okay? This is, geometrically, it's easy to see. It's difficult to, to, to see it in the sense of constraints, okay? Um, for example, examples of convexity are linear constraints, For example, Euclidean norms, and bounds also. So, So, the thing is, it's easy to see geometrically that C is all the constraints, okay? However, let's put some examples. Linear constraints are convex. Why, for example, just imagine we have two constraints that the, the theta should be here. So here in this set, this is convex. So for example, it, this means that theta must be larger than zero, Theta one, this is theta one, and this is theta two. Imagine this plane. Theta two should, should be also larger than zero, and one minus theta, no, theta one plus theta two should be larger than one. Okay, so these are constraints, linear constraints. These linear constraints define a convex set. Okay, so when you have constraints, if they are linear, for example, you can see that they they are they provide a convex set. Okay. Another examples are the norms of theta. It will be very important. Both the linear constraints and, and norms. We will use it during the course. And also bounds of theta. They are also convex. Okay. So the thing is, um, just I I put some some examples where you can find convexity in the set. Okay. Okay, this is uh, not trivial, always to find, to identify these convex sets. And just to, to let you know, uh, sometimes there are operators that preserve convexity. So for example, if you have this, that it's convex, you can have operators like logarithm and some operators that preserve convexity. And sometimes, sometimes you don't see that the problem is convex, <laughs> but doing some tricky, some tricks, you can uh, uh, realize that your problem is convex. Okay, and this is not easy okay, to know if your problem is convex. Sometimes it's easy to identify, sometimes it's not. Imagine you have to, to prove that it's convex for any t, this, 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 okay? And prove convex with the other constraints. But it's not always easy, okay? So, why convex is important? Why convexity is important? If the, if the function is convex, then a local minimum Someone knows the answer. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but uh, who knows if, if the function is convex, then a local minimum is a, a global yeah. minimum. Yes, right.
If the function, sorry, no, if the problem, sorry. Okay. And sometimes we only have local complexity. Global minimum is not guaranteed. So, why convexity is important? No. If the problem is convex, then a local minimum is a global minimum. A, a, global, a local minimum is a global minimum. A local minimizer, I prefer to say local minimizer is a global minimizer. And I'm not going to prove it because so it's going to be the time, but um, and it's important. Why? Because if we identify that our problem is convex, if, as I was saying, if we identify that our problem is convex, once you get the optimal solution, you can be satisfied that your problem, that the minimum is the, the only minimum, and and the and the global and the uh, uh, local minima is the, the the global minima. Okay. So you you just find one and you say this is my solution. Okay. And this is very important because uh, sometimes you don't know if it's convex or not. So knowing about convexity is important because you say, look, this is my, the minimum is the, the best minimum. There is no nothing better than this. And there is only one minimum, only one, right? Or maybe infinity, but all the same have the same value, OK? Sometimes a lot of problems, a lot of problems are convex. And we don't know in, in the machine learning, more, most of them are convex, most of them. In computational engineering, are, there are many which are also convex, but sometimes we don't even know that they are, but they are convex. And a lot of applications, they are not convex. Okay. If we, if we don't have convexity, what we say, we, we, we relax this constraint, we, we say that we are going to be local convex, or we will have a local minimum, okay. local convexity. So around your, the point you are there, you can say that you have this property of convexity. Okay. This property of, of this and the convex set. Okay, so you will find a minimum that is okay, but it's not going to be maybe the first, the best minimum. It depends, of course, of the initial point. Okay. Just a, a parenthesis: we are speaking about uh, continuous optimization uh, for people who are working also on this. Uh, there are also uh, possibilities of using non-continuous optimization, like. Um, the algorithm or like um, um, how are they called uh, the ones that are uh, I, I don't remember but it, you are just trying uh, to put uh, to, to add some points and you want to uh, get better and better with no information about uh, convexity so uh, it's not using gradients and it's not using convex uh, optimization these algorithms um, the evolutionary optimization sorry these algorithms um, are okay when you have just a few variables, four, five, six, ten. You want to explore somehow, and you don't have information about gradient, and you don't want to think of it. But at, if you have some information of gradients, of even even of complexity, uh, optimization, you can you can solve problems with very very large uh, numbers of, of design variables. So in machine learning, typically theta can be huge. I don't know, more than even millions or thousands, mm, a lot of people. So it, this is impossible to solve it with genetic algorithms. Yes. The continuous optimization, but even of the continuous, the function is continuous. Yes, we speak about uh, the function is continuous. And, has and sometimes we will ask that is, that, that is C1, so it's differentiable. But, uh, so we have derivatives. But sometimes we will don't require this. But at least we will say that we have continuous functions okay this is what we we will ask we will not speak about for example the absolute value is a continuous function but it's not but it's not differentiable okay you, we can use this and the evolution of algorithm also solve continuous they, yes they can solve continuous problems the, the thing is that the way they use it is that um or the algorithms that are behind, they can only solve problems with very small number of design variables. 
So you cannot ask for theta to be very large because the algorithms that are behind are not going to use properties that we are going to see. Are going, they are going to try to just change the, 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 the value and try to see if doing some permutation or mutations, you get something better. But you don't uh, use the property of convexity, then you, you use the property of, of uh, convex optimization. Okay. Okay. Uh, more questions about this? Or your chat? No? Okay. Yes. The, this is the, uh, the document. Um, so here you will find a, a, some or less. Can you go down? And, ah, it's is it there? Yeah. Yes. So you will find more or less the, the same here, okay? This is convex optimization, the convex sets, okay? This is what I was saying. And then why it's important, okay? Great. Let's do the first example. <clears throat> For example, linear program so linear programming it's a complex problem. You will find many um, versions of it. Okay? Let me write here, it's just one. Okay. Um, so, linear programming. The function is linear, the constraints are linear. It's called linear programming because, because it's coming from what I was saying before, mathematical programming. And people that were using this linear programming in the 50s, 40s, even in, before uh, when we uh, of, of finite elements you know, we were developing. When computers were starting uh, using it, people were trying to solve this kind of problems because they have pl plenty of applications we have of this in, in electrical engineering, in e everywhere you will find a lot of applications of this problem, okay? Just to give you an intuition, So this is the convex set where the linear constraints, or the linear constraints, they find this convex set, okay? Imagine this is theta one and theta two, just in two variables. And then C gives you a, a line with a slope. And then if you go up there, you're maximizing, depends, depending on of, of C, of the, of the sign of C. And if you go down, you minimize. So then the optimal problem, the optimal the solution is there because is, as you were saying before, is in the boundaries. You can prove that it's always in the boundaries and linear programming. Okay, so you have, your cost is going to be minimized going down here and you want a feasible point. So you, you must be inside here. So the, the, the feasible point that has less value is this point. Okay, so the, the feasible point, the, the point that satisfies the constraints, that has minimum value, is this point. Okay, is it more or less clear or yes? Okay, so this is linear programming. This is two dimensions, easy to see, it seems easy, but imagine you have theta 1000. Imagine how is this become set. Very difficult. Okay. So lots of applications. Plus, many. And also most of the times theta is large. Okay, theta is very, very large. Okay. Algorithms to solve this problem. Does anyone Knows an algorithm for solving, or the typical algorithm for solving linear programming? Or remembers, someone who remembers an algorithm for it, for linear programming? Maybe that you have studied in engineering or courses? Simplex. Simplex, yes. Have you seen Simplex before? Some of you? 
Yes? No? So please raise your hand, the one that has seen Simplex before, please. Many, many years ago. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah, Simplex. So Simplex, what he's doing, just I will say, is that it's a more or less all the algorithm, okay? What you do, typically you start from a point here and you move through boundaries. You ask which is the slope that has less value and you move through there. And then you reach here and then you go here. Okay. So you do a slope and you uh, compute exactly the slope, the, the size, the step to get here. And then you do the same to get here. Okay. But this is easy to be. A polyhedron is in, in 3D and it's very difficult to move. It's not easy. So it's difficult to imagine. People were working, many people were working on that time in optimization. So to solve this, I'm very patient to solve this problem very patiently. <laughs> Simplex works well. The solution is unique. So if you find the minimum, it's okay. Sometimes it's zero, sometimes. But it, it has solved many problems and still now that people are using it, okay? There is another one. So simplex, you move through points, okay? There's another one which is interior point. One <laughs> algorithm. Did you see it in the last, uh, the, my letter? Yeah. Okay. And what you do, so here you do like this, you move here, then here, and then you reach here, this is simplex. And here, what you do is interior point. Why interior point? Because you want, you you, you go through the interior, the convex end. And there's another way to, to go to the optimum value. The algorithms are not going to explain the data just to let you know that linear programming can be solved with simple and also with interior point methods. Interior point methods, what you do just, the idea is you penalize with a logarithmic barrier the constraints in a way that if you are here, if you want to minimize, being here it is very much penalized. You don't like, you, you penalize to be in the, in the boundary. You want to be in the interior. So you, you penalize the constraints in a way that you move through, always through the, the convex set, okay? And you use a new term in iterations and it's, right? Okay, so this is the first uh, example. Questions about this? Maybe in the, in the chat, is there any question in the chat? Yes. So no, 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 simplex. But um, what if the minimum is not at the boundary? But because it seems that simplex is just trying the boundary. Yeah. In linear programming, the solution is always in the in the boundary. Yes, but it's true that you can use interior point methods, not in linear programming, maybe quadratic or convex programming or non-convex programming, and it's you maybe you will not the solution is not in the boundary. Maybe it's in the interior, but you will move from here. To there, also the inside the, in the interior. So we have questions in the, in the chat. Someone who has the chat, uh, someone can tell me if there is some question. Yes. So uh, when we are plotting uh, this. Uh, uh, so uh, essentially, like we are plotting the function values here. Yeah. yeah, no. So what we are plotting, yes, uh, maybe I was a little fast. What we are plotting here, okay, are the constraints. Remember that the convex set where we want to, to solve the solutions are defined by the constraints. And here we plot with lines in this example, which is easy because it's two dimensions. We plot it with a line, the function, because it's a linear function. Okay, so we move the function and we, so when we move a function, it means that we move through points. So we have many possibilities of all this. And, we, and if we want to minimize, we want to go down. From all these points, the one that has less values here, so it's at minus infinity, but the one that is inside the domain is feasible. So you have to fulfill the constraints is this point, okay? Questions? Okay. So now let's go to uh, unconstrained optimization.
So we want to minimize the function with no constraints. Okay, just minimize the function. As I was saying, in machine learning we will find many. Machine learning sometimes you will see that um, sometimes these constraints, even if they are not linear, you can add it in the cost. You can penalize it. So you can reformulate sometimes. It's not exact. Sometimes you can add the constraints in the cost in a way that you have a non a non uh, constraint problem, an unconstrained optimization problem. So even if I'm constraining optimization problems, we can think of it as maybe a simplification, as just a simplified version of, of this problem. It's true, but it has also many applications because a lot of people they want to solve problems where we, we have only a cost function. Okay. So you can just add your uh, constraints in the cost, penalizing it. So if you are far from the solution, you penalize it. Okay, so it's just to tell you that in machine learning, uh, a lot of times constraints are framed, are avoided through the penalization. Okay, because you want to minimize fast. In machine learning, the idea is you want to minimize fast, fast, fast. And each step, you want to make it better, 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 better. Okay, so with a lot of uh, data, with a lot of data, you have a huge amount of, of data. So you want to minimize, minimize, minimize. You don't want to have always the best uh, solution, but you want to minimize, minimize the average iteration, you want to make it better, 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 okay? So constraints sometimes uh, brings problems. So uh, many people are trying to use these constraints in the cost function. They add these constraints in the cost function, okay? So that is why uh, constraint optimization has also many applications, even if, they don't, if we don't see it um, directly the constraints, okay? So, uh, we will say that F might be con uh, con uh, convex. Sometimes we, we will not ask for it. As you were saying, we will ask to be C1 so that we have gradients. If not, we can we can use uh, some tools to have it, okay? Like regularization, for example. So for all theta, we, we ask that we have gradients, okay? For example, as I was saying, the norm of theta is, is not differentiable. It's not differentiable. Okay. So now let's speak about the first the first order. Optimality conditions. Okay. Continuous means uh, continuity. Is, so this is not continuous, for example. This is continuous, but uh, it's not differentiable. So we ask for continuity, also here, continuity, but also we ask for differentiability. So in this case, it's not differentiable. For example, this case is differentiable. Yes, we, we, we say that this case is not differentiable, but we say that it's differentiable, see why. So that it, there exists a gradient, a gradient exists. Okay. But sometimes, sometimes we will relax this constraint, like condition, and we will say, okay, it's not differentiable, and we will use some, some tools, okay? Okay, first optimality or the optimality conditions. This is very important. Why is important this? Because how do we know that a, an optimization problem has has finished? How do we know that we have finished uh, and that this is the, the best value? What do you think? How, how we can know that we do an algorithm and how do we know that this theta, this value of theta, the current one, is the optimal one? Who can uh, help me with this? How could you say that this theta is, is the best one? Why? How, how are we going to stop? How would you say? Gradient is zero. Yes. Exactly. You remember this, I probably that you have worked on this, uh, that the gradient of a function when it's zero, 
uh, is going to solve the, the, the problem as, uh, is, is solved. When you have unconstrained optimization problems, if not, this condition is not, it's not, not working anymore. Tomorrow in the morning, we will see problems and optimality conditions where we will have constraints and these conditions are not going to, to be the same. Okay? So when we, this is what we have studied years ago. When we have an unconstrained optimization problem, we ask that the range is going to be zero. Let's see how it comes, because tomorrow we will need it also for constrained optimization problems. A lot of problems in computational mechanics and engineering are also uh, can be written as this. And we will have a whole lecture trying to connect how computational engineering with optimization, uh, or, or how many many problems, Stokes problem, uh, elasticity, many problems can be seen as a minimization problem, contact problems. Okay, so we'll try to connect it. All, all these things, we will try to understand the Lagrange multipliers, all these things in, in the sense of optimization. Okay, okay. so if F is convex, now it's going to be a little tedious, but I think we have to do it. If F is convex and C1, then for all theta and alpha, F of theta plus radius of F of theta plus alpha minus theta is more or equal than F of alpha. Okay, this is uh, an important condition. Let's see how, how what does it mean and why we have this condition. So imagine you have F of alpha. Okay, so imagine you have a function, you have a function, okay, and you have a point here where you have theta and f of theta, okay? So what you are saying is, this is f, f of alpha, okay? You are saying that in this point you have the value theta and the value f of theta, okay? Then you say that the line, which is the first Taylor expansion of the, of the function, is going to be always below the function. So this is typically what we say that the tangent of a convex function is going to be below. We usually know that when you have some differentiability, the tangent is passing through, through, through the line. But in this case, since we are using convexity, the function has this shape, we can say always that the line is going to be below an hyperplane, we say, the convex function. Okay, and this is important. With this function, this line, line function is going to be below the, the convex function. Let's see how or why is uh, easy. So let's try to take. So let's prove it in one D, and in R N it's the same. In one D proof, in one D. I will try to avoid the uh, proofs, but I think this one is important. So let's let's use convexity. Okay. So if the function is convex, as we were saying before, we will use theta zero and theta one, but now it's theta and alpha. So the function is always below the linear approximation, as we were doing before. Okay. And this these lines here we were taking before. Remember. <laughs> so we we do exactly the same convexity. Okay. Now. Let's pass this term here in the left side, left hand side, and we will divide uh, with t. So this, this term we leave it. One minus t, theta plus t of alpha minus, we pass this one, f of theta, the first one with the one, and then we divide it by t plus f of theta is more or equal than f of alpha. So what, I, what did I do? I, I took the first one, f of theta, and put it here, okay? The minus. <laughs> then I have, the with, with t, I put it in the left side, hand side. The minus is going to be here with a t. But here we have a t, and here we have a t. 
So I divided by D in all the equations here, here, and we have it here. Okay? You see? So I do it again. This is this is uh, convexity. Then now it's then wait. I think someone in the room has the mic open. Hello. Now, ready. So the function here, okay, we subtract f of theta here, then we we subtract here, then this t we pass it to the left is here with a t, and here we have also the t, but then we divide it by t, so t is cancelled here, here, and it's going to be here. Okay. We take then the limit, and then this is the gradient. So f of theta plus the gradient of f. So I prove just with convexity and the limit. So this part of this is the gradient, okay? Um, minus or equal of f of theta, okay? Uh, of, uh, f of alpha, okay? So an hyperplane, so convexity you have here, it's like you take you are taking the line uh, up to here and you will see that the gradient is in fact an hyperplane down, okay? Below the convex function. Why is this important? Let's see why is this important. Yes, another thing I, I forgot to say is that this is a Taylor approximation of f of alpha in, in theta, okay? Yes. Many write the equation so that every result would be minimum. Yes, do, do someone remember this? How we know if it's a maximum or a minimum? It's not good. It's complex. Yes. <clears throat> the, 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 if we have differentiability, twice differentiality is is that the second derivative is definitely positive. But we usually don't have, or we, maybe we don't have uh, second second. But if the function is convex uh, and we have only one solution, the minimum, the only solution of this problem is going to be uh, a minimum, okay, because of convexity. Let's uh, recall that another convexity, the line is above. But this is not convex. This is convex. Yeah, this is not convex. Okay. Because any line like this, this is con uh, concave. Any line is going to be below, it's not, it's not going to be above. Before. So remember convexity it has a line like this. So the function is going to be below the line. But I think that it's also convex because if you draw the whole like a circle, it's a convex. There are two things: the convex set and the convex function. We are speaking now of the convex function. We don't have convex set now. We don't have constraints. We already have a minimization function. So we speak about the function. So if the function is convex, is this definition? Okay. The solution, we will see now that the gradient should be zero. And the solution of the gradient equal to zero, it, it's only possible, only one possibility because of convexity. But if you have conca it's concave, it's going to be the contrary, the maximum. Okay. And you can identify this, which is the same of convexity. If it's differentiable, it's the second derivative uh, definite positive. If it's not differentiable, it's just convexity. So sometimes you, what you want to prove is not is convexity not the, that the one way to prove convexity if it's differential twice differentiable is seeing it that the the, 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 the the Hessian is definitely positive. But maybe it, it's not uh, twice differentiable. So what you want to see if it's convex, if it's convex, then if the gradient is zero, then the solution is a minimum. That is the first the first order of the optimal conditions. Let's see it now. So, ah, yes, this, I forgot to say this. This, this is uh, maybe some uh, curiosity, but it's, it's not curiosity, it's, it's useful. So you see this hyperplane, this line is, if it's convex, local information, local information means only gradient of f and f uh, provides you 
global information. You see, for any point, this is a reference going to be below the function. So usually, uh, you have local information gives you local properties, but here local information gives you provides you global information, and this is because of convexity. And this is it's a curiosity, but it's useful. It's very useful uh, for for finding the minimum. Okay. Um, we say that this function is an underestimate of the function. Okay. There, are just, there are some methods that what they do is they, they start finding many hyperplanes. Okay. There are other that are doing this, but this, this is not going to be explored. Okay, um, so what do we, if, if exists one theta such that the gradient of f of theta is, is zero. If exists one theta that the gradient is zero, then f of theta is going to be smaller or equal to f of alpha for all alpha. You see, so this is the condition of a minimum. So first order optimality conditions means that to find an optimal is when the gradient is zero. Because we have seen that if the gradient is zero, the function is going to be smaller than, than any value of the function. So the function in theta is going to be smaller of the function in any alpha. So it means that theta is an a minimum. Okay. So this is something that uh, we know. Okay. Tomorrow we will see an extension with Lagrange multipliers. But today we have seen that uh, through convexity, <coughs> through convexity, because you see, if the gradient is zero, if this is zero, then f of theta is smaller than f of alpha. Okay? Yes. But like we can equally say that it depends on this, the sign of this. You cannot say anything, yes. So it must be zero. Okay? So this is an optimality condition. So sometimes, sometimes instead of solving the minimization problem with an algorithm, you want to solve an equation. The gradient of f, the theta equal, equal to zero. You probably will see, for example, for example, an example of in, in computational mechanics. You want to solve the energy, minimize the energy, the internal minus the external, external energy. You can minimize it, or you take the gradient. If you don't have constraints, if you have no constraint, you take the gradient, you have the equilibrium problem. The gradient equal to zero. And you solve this. In fact, what we solve in the finite elements of elasticity, we solve equil equilibrium equations, which are the minimum of this, an unconstrained minimization problem. So sometimes, or most of the times, what you solve with this problem. If it's quadratic, maybe this, this problem can be it's, it's linear, and you can solve it directly. If it's not quadratic, if it's more complex, it's not easy to find the solution of this. Maybe you will need to do some iterative processes. OK? Questions? The chat questions. I, I I have not seen questions in the chat. Someone who has uh, the chat is there. There is any questions in the chat or not? No. no? Okay. I mean, I log out. I don't know. You don't know because you don't have uh, access to the chat or yes? Because I log out. I okay. Know. Someone who is also connected uh, online. Someone is connected online. Yeah, well connected. <laughs> is there a question uh, online? No. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Let's speak about this uh, second con uh, differentiable condition. If F is convex and C2, I say in the regular expansion, So f of alpha is equal to f of theta plus gradient of f of theta alpha minus theta Uh, 
Then F of theta square is equal to F of theta or similar of alpha minus alpha minus theta square. So if We do a serial expansion now. We ask for the function to be C2, so differentiable twice, okay? So it's differentiable. Then we can do a Taylor expansion, right? F of alpha is F of theta, radiant, quadratic part, quadratic part, and an extra part, okay? The outside that they can, then, and then we have the we take, imagine we have a point which satisfies the first order con optimality condition. Imagine, this is zero. So we have this point. If you go here, this term cancels, okay? So we take the F theta star here, and then we pass this, the, the other part to the left-hand side. So F of theta star is equal to F of alpha minus all this part. Okay, which is this part. Okay. So if F in radius of F is zero, then the function is going to be of theta star smaller than F of alpha for any alpha. Okay. See if the second derivative is semi-definite positive, because you remember that if it's semi-definite or definite positive, this this is uh, larger than zero, so a negative value of this this number is going to be smaller than this one. Okay. So um, imagine you don't you don't know how to prove convexity, which could be possible. Sometimes you cannot prove, but you have. C2 function, okay? Then if this, you have a point which satisfies the first of the optimality conditions, so you see that the gradient is zero, then if this point in the, in the, the Hessian of at this point is definitely positive, which is expensive, usually computationally, then this point is, is the optimal one. So this, if it's convex, for sure, this is going to be the solution. But imagine that you don't have, you, you, you have not proved that it's convex. Then if you have this condition, you can be, you, you can be sure that this, this solution is, a, is an optimal one. OK? Questions? Yes. yes. So the condition is if f theta is definitive something. Yes. Sorry. Let's be the And. We say that a point is a minimum if, imagine you don't have convexity. You don't know that it's convex. But you know that you can differentiate twice. And you find a point that satisfies this condition. For example, equilibrium. Then, if the second derivative of the function or the Hessian, we call it sometimes, is definitely positive, which means that at this point, is, is positive. For example, you find the eigenvalues and, and, and are positive, the, the smaller one and the bigger one. Then this solution, this point, this point is the minimum. You are sure it's the minimum. For example, this can be the stiffness matrix in, in elasticity. And the stiffness matrix is always the minimum. So if you find equilibria, you already know that is the solution of the problem. Okay. No questions? 
we have to have the the two elements first that the the gradient is zero and then the second derivative must be positive and there's the minimum that then you're sure you it's the minimum yes if not it can be two, uh, three three things or the minimum or the maximum, the maximum. or solid point which kind of solid point which are that, that uh, are minimum in one variable and maximum in others okay. sometimes it happens you find solid problem we will see in with Lagrange multipliers when we have constraints in fact what we solve is a solid problem okay. Okay, let's do the second example. And this is with a lot, a lot of machine learning flavor. Second example. Least a square problem. Okay, this is core problem. Uh, please raise your hand uh, who has heard about this before. This is core problem. So, this is core problems, and it's a an constraint optimization problem, and it's convex. And constraint convex. Well, how do we write it? F mean of theta of f of theta of zero theta. The cost function is going to be. Sometimes it depends on the on the people. You write it with uh, with one half or without. It depends. Okay. I prefer it in this case without one half. Okay. Yes, yes, I'm going to, to say that. What does it mean? This means so this is A is a matrix, okay? Theta is a vector and B is a vector. Okay. So this is a, a matrix times a vector must be similar to another vector. Okay, so you ask how much should be theta in a way that having information of A, the combination of some vectors of A is very similar to B. That's what you ask. In which norm, the actual norm? What does it mean? It means that you take the vector, all this is the typical L2 norm, which is each component uh, the square, and the addition of all the components, and then you take the square root of it. So, you know, that's the typical, the, the, the actual norm of this is the square of e to, e to one square, square. So I take all the components of the error of this vector, and I, and I uh, do a power of two and then the square. But I, since I take the, the square of here, you remove the, the square, okay? Curiosities. This problem is convex. Why? Because it's quadratic. And we can take the first derivative, we can take the second derivative, we can, it's differentiable, yes? We can take the second derivative and you will see that it's definitely positive, and then it's convex, and your solutions. But, important thing, um, sometimes, and we will see, it, it will depend on the matrix A, okay? How A it is, is it square? Is it rectangular? Which shape does it have? And for those who like or prefer uh, tensor notation, I will write it like this. Okay, again, who has used tensor notation before? Please can you uh, raise your hand? Great. So the idea is you have indices, and, and you multiply the indices and you do an addition of them. Okay, so J and J, it's like you add all of them. This is a multiplication of A times theta. Okay, so the column that is multiplying and adding, it's J. Okay, and you see this is a vector of I, and this is a vector of I, so I times I is a number. When it's a multiplication, you contract indices. Okay, so you contract these indices with this, and now you use another, another letter, for this multiplication, we say that this is um, 
uh, hidden hidden indices, and also these ones. Okay. Let's do the first of the conditions. So how it works. So you have to have the derivative, so the, the, the gradient of f of zero of theta is a j. So I I I I I show you how I do it with 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 notation, okay? With index notation. I have a so what you do is you 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 do the derivative with respect to theta, but with another index m, okay? So i i j you leave it. Then theta j, theta j, the derivative of theta j with respect to theta m. This typically is delta j m, okay? The Kronecker. So if j is equal to m is one or if not is zero, okay? B you is zero the derivative, so you have still this thing, this term plus now this one. A, I, K, and then the derivative of K with M, delta K, M. Okay. So now you have A, I, J here, A, I, K. So let's write it A, I, J, delta J, M. So J and J, you change it and you put M. J with J with this uh, delta chlorinator. Okay. A, I, K, theta K minus. Huh? This, yes, I forgot it. So what's, what's yes, yes. One second. I, uh, let, me, let me finish. I, I will. Yes, I will say. It. Um, AMJ AK theta K minus AJ BI. No, AM plus AJ. A K no K and K of M theta J minus B I A I M. Yes, what I was saying is that okay, this, this is the Gato derivative. I don't know if you guys got the uh, derivative or the actual derivative. So what you do is you because this is more general, but uh, it, it's like the partial derivative. Uh, okay. What you do is you, you do the derivative of this, okay? And when you see theta, you do the derivative of theta, but then you have to multiply times the direction. Okay, so when you do this, in fact, is this times the, the, the direction. Okay, sometimes this is what we do uh, when we have uh, the Gatot derivative of the, of the partial derivative in, in, or the directional derivative. This is the partial derivative and applied to this direction is what we call the, the, the directional derivative, okay? Understand is we are calculating this partial derivative at this point, theta theta, and then all the theta should be theta theta, right? Or no, this is the direction. Theta. So, for example, it's typically the direction of the perturbation of the point. Uh, value is a fixed. Uh, yes, it's for all. All this is all, for example. If, if you're more familiar with uh, finite elements or, or I don't know, yes, uh, uh, weak formulations of, of uh, PVEs, this is typically the test function. Or this, this is typically the direction where you did a uh, hands derivative, you do derivatives. It's general. For any, you do for the, the partial derivative for any direction of theta. Okay. If you are, if you prefer to, to think of error n in general, uh, you just uh, put it here like this, and this is the derivative. With this, you will have like a this is the partial derivative, and and times the direction is the, the, the directional derivative. Okay. Okay. So now this is the same as this one. I J I M I M I K. So K and and J J and J is a, is a 
is a high end value, so you can change the names. So you have it twice. AIM, AIK, twice, theta K minus, and here you have it twice, twice, AIM, BI, theta equal to zero. Then you have that the two, you can cancel it, and then you have A transpose EA equal to A transpose B. Okay, and this is the first order optimality condition. This is the first order optimality conditions for the least score problem. So, um, if I, I if I go fast, uh, um, you can see the note uh, at home slowly by slowly, and you can ask me. But it's just taking a tensor notation, okay? Um, so here I have the derivative with uh, theta m. Then I, I, I took this uh, higher value with M, with K. And then uh, I, I, this is the same as this one. This is the same as this one. Two, two, two. You can see the two. And this, you can see that it's I transpose A times theta equal I transpose theta. OK? So now, why is it important this in machine learning? And why is this important in general? So this is a problem. What you want to do, typically, Okay, let's put it here. Okay, so what we have to solve is to solve this problem. A transpose A, theta, A transpose B. What is the second derivative of this problem? Second derivative of this problem is A transpose A. Okay, because if you take the, the derivative of theta here, you will only have this. Is this definitely positive? But the first order derivative works. Yes, this is the first order derivative. And if you take another derivative, you will have only this term because you see the linear part is only theta here. They have again uh, against theta. This is the first order. Now, if you take the second derivative of this equation, then you will only end up with a theta, a transpose a. This is typically called. In machine learning covariance matrix, and, and these also are called normal equations. Normal equations. So now, and this is beautiful. Why? Let's see why is this beautiful. Because what does it mean? You have to solve this problem. A transpose A. Is it is it a uh, symmetric? It takes the, the, the transpose, so this A transpose A is exactly the same. Yes, it's symmetric. Symmetric means uh, all the all the numbers are uh, real. Is it definitely positive? And this is a very important part. This is very important. If it's definitely positive, you have a minimum, it's convex. Right? You have one minimum. Maybe you can have many minimums. So how? Let's see. This A transpose A is symmetric, but it's always square. So what you want to do, maybe, is to do an inverse and solve this problem. You have A, you, you have B, you, you multiply here, you have here, and you do an inverse. OK. But A transpose A, maybe, can have not full, full rank. Let's see first case, case where A is a square. So what, what you want to do? What you want to do is to solve this problem. This problem is used in many problems. You have you have to solve a linear system of equations if a is a square. So solving this problem if a is a square it is exactly the same as this one. Okay. You can take this and you can do it if, if A is invertible. If not, if not, if it's not invertible, maybe you cannot solve this problem. Okay? Probably you will not solve this problem. And many situations is like this. Okay. If the case of A is in this case is vertical shape or has vertical shape, what does it mean? A is like this. 
you want what you want to do is to solve. In fact, you want that this is similar to this. You, you have a lot of equations and few variables. But you cannot solve this problem. You have seen it. We know that this problem, we cannot solve it. Or you can, we can solve it, but what, what is happening? We have a lot of equations and many and, and, and few variables. What is typically happening? Many solutions. Is that unique? OK. We say that it's over the nine. Many solutions. More equations. Yes, sorry. No solution. Yes, 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 yes. We have few variables and a lot of equations. It is difficult to fulfill a lot of equations with few variables. You cannot. So it's it's overdetermined. So the solution is not unique. You don't have solution if you want to solve this problem. In the sense of, of linear equations. But in the sense of optimization, what is happening? You do A transpose A equal A transpose B. So A transpose A, you will have this matrix like this. Okay, and this and this one it has solution has inverse. Okay. It also can be it depends. It, it depends on the rank of A. But imagine if A has full rank in the sense of all the all the all the, all the lines are all the rows are in the um, so yes. You have you will have a many more equations than theta, okay? So imagine all of them, okay, are well, are um, are linear independent. Yes, linear independent. But of course, some of them will be linear dependent of this because you have more, okay, than, than these equations. The thing is that you you don't have really zero equal to zero and this kind of thing, okay? But once you do it like this, okay, a transpose a, this a transpose a has inverse. Okay, because you all of these equations, this now, and you see, you see, you, you what you want to do is a transpose a times theta equal to a transpose times v. Okay, and this will be something like this. Okay, so now you have to, to solve a, a smaller number of equations before you want you think that you have many equations but you cannot uh, solve this problem sorry this problem you cannot solve this problem what you do you relax it instead of you doing this what you do is you want in l to norm that these are very similar to this you relax it you don't solve it exactly it, there, there will be an error of course okay you will not be zero this but you do and this we will see it how we do like an L2 averaging in the sense that we, we give the same importance to all of the equations. Okay, so we try to solve it in, in a more relaxed way. We cannot solve it, but we, we have a solution. What is the solution? Is a theta that is not going to be, we, don't, we will not have B, but will be very similar to B in L2 norm. This is what we, have, we will have. It's something. Okay. Okay. Must yes. Be yes. Square and inversible. Yes. Like square and inversible. Two properties, right? They are not. Yes. Yes. Because it's you can you can prove it because it's symmetric and it depends on the rank of, of a. And for example, the first case, if a is square, then it can be inverse, or it must. It depends be. also if a is inverse. Yes. Okay. It depends on a. A, 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 a transpose a must be inversible. Must be inversible to solve this problem. Yes. This problem and this problem is inversible, but this problem it depends on a on the rank of a, okay? Because you see, you it, it, it depends if you have sometimes here you can have you think you have many equations that are, are all, all independent, but in fact, it's the same equation many times. Imagine, yes, 
And in fact, you thought that you have many equations, but you only have one. And you don't have a, a like a very large uh, rectangular shape like this. In fact, what you have is a rectangular shape, not a vertical shape, you have a rectangular shape. As we are going to see it now. So it depends on, on, on the dependency of these equations. But let's suppose that we have a rank of A enough to be larger than, than the, the, the number of theta. In a way that you have in, in, that the, the, the independent, linear independent equations of A, so all of them, they will be uh, at least larger than theta. So you will have um, a vertical, a vertical A. Okay. Let's see the contrary. So A has horizontal shape. We want that a times theta is equal to b, right? We want this, we don't have it. We can so what's happening here? We have more and more than equations. We say this is undetermined. And now, A transpose A, which is the contrary of A. Okay, this has not full run. So the problem is imposed. And we know plenty of solutions, many solutions. Okay. So now is the contrary. We have a lot of variables and just few equations. We want to fulfill a, a lot of a few equations with a lot of variables. Okay, so um, what we will have is many thetas that are possible to solve the problem. Okay, and in fact, if you do this, you want to solve this. This a transpose a is not invertible. It's definite positive, but it's semi-definite positive. So you have a lot of eigenvalues that are zero. So you have plenty of, of solutions. Okay. And this, in machine learning, we will see it also in the practical part. This, when you have, uh, sorry, this, when you have few values and a lot of equations to fulfill, you say, this is what we say, it's underfitted because we, we put just a uh, few values of theta. Someone can, can say, why you cannot have more thetas if you want to, to have it, if, it, if you are trying to do machine learning. If, if you have this problem and theta is some parameters that you can have, why you, you don't do more thetas? And then you, you, you will have more capacity to, to have the, to be, uh, and of course, and if you have a few values of theta, you're under the manual. So you, you are under fitting. But, on the fitting. We will relate it there later and after the post. Underfitted. But if you have the contrary, you are overfitting. So you are trying to fulfill some equations. You have some data, but just this data, few data, and you propose many, many, many design variables. You will have overfitting, which is not desired. So you will see that theta must be uh, taking in some, the number of thetas must be taken in some way or we, do, we will use another trick. Okay. So these are cost problems are as the first example of uh, machine learning that typically what you want is to fit some data. Okay. And I think I, not, I have not seen, uh, okay, but it's just what you want to do 
this you have some data. Okay, and you want to find a linear combination that is going to pass uh, to 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 fit precisely this this x. Okay, in L2 norm. So here you will have errors. We will see it later eh, with more not more detail. But this is the typical listed for problem. So in the optimization sense, is convex, is unconstrained. Depending on a, we will we will know uh, the second derivative can be definitely positive or not. So maybe we will have one mu in this case, or maybe we will have many in the other case because this one is definitely positive. A transpose a is invertible and this case is not. Okay. Another way to see it is that what you do is a. So this is a geometric interpretation of it. We have seen a more fitting inter uh, interpretation of it. What you want to do is to fulfill this equation, but you pre multiply by a transpose. So what you ask is that the error are zero, but in the columns of a. So considering combinations of the columns of a, you could ask, for example, to say, I have many equations here. OK, I will try to just solve the first uh, five. If I have five in unknowns, only the first five. Or not the second five, or I don't know. Or maybe, so this means to put ones here, it transpose a. So a matrix before here, you put ones and zeros. This is an option. Another option, uh, zeros and ones. Or another option to take into account information of a, which is the one that says, wait, it has a, 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 a fitting meaning. It means that we will solve this problem in L2 norm. We will be very similar to this uh, in L2 norm, in the columns, measure, measuring with the columns of A. Okay. Wait. Questions? Yes. Um, I learned the problem is not if A is over determined or under determined, the problem is not solvable, but we can multiply a transpose and then the problem is solvable. For example, but are there still the same problem? Yes, I, I yes, have yes. No. So let's. Let, the way I, I like to present it is you have a lot of, for example, in this case, you have a lot of equations. And you have to fulfill this equation, and you don't have capacity for fulfilling. For, 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 you, you, you cannot, if you have this number of theta. Okay. So you say, okay, let's do it weaker. Let's do it not all are not going to be zero. This is not anymore to be exactly B. But I will try to do it in average. I will try to that all of them, that the error, or all the columns, in L2 norm are uh, smaller, the same the same weight to all of them. So this equation, the second, the third, all of them, they want that the error of them are very small in L2 norm, and, and the same important to all of them. So it's a way of solving this problem, but considering the L2 norm of the difference of the error. Okay, you, you try to fit not exactly, but just in average all the equations. But these equations will, will be small. This equation will be the error, or the norm of this equation will be small. This one also small. And all of them, I want to minimize all the, the differences at the same time. This is what does it mean minimization. So instead of solving the equation that you cannot, you say, OK, I am not going to solve the equation. I will ask to that each equation has a small value and a small error in a square. Why do we need to solve the problem? This is the second order derivative equals zero, right? This problem. No, you won't imagine you want to solve this problem because I don't know uh, you have some data B and you want to, to just uh, with, with a combination of so linear combinations, for example, of data. Imagine you have this data B and you have also the dependent that B should be a combination of, of data also of A. Okay, and you have only this data. You cannot you cannot uh, Provide more details because you have this data, right? And you and you want to to say, okay, I want to fulfill these equations, but but I have just this capacity. What is the best I can do? What do I do? So you cannot uh, fulfill it. So one option is less the square error and uh, problem, which is each equation I will try to have a very small error norm. Each of I, oh, this one minimize the every each each equation the error of each equation. Right, that's what I pro uh, I propose. There are other possibilities. We will see. So this is a, a 
approximated solution. Huh? The solution is sure. the, yes. The problem changed. We can say that least the square problem is trying to solve an, uh, a linear system of equations that cannot be solved. An approximation, something the best you can do in this L2 norm. Okay. The L2 norm comes from it is a second order derivative because we, as beginning, want to solve the minimize optimization problem and we solve the first order derivative and then the second order derivative is this equation a theta equals b this this one is the first order derivative in fact yes. this is first order yes, yes. the second order is speaking only about this the definite positivity of this but the, the, the answer is yes having a transpose a as an equation and a semi-definite positive problem is because we have used L2 norm. If we have used another norm, we will not have this, this matrix here. We will see now other norms. And in, in, in the in the in the practical part with Antonio, um, it, we will solve this problem. This list of, the first example we will do is this list of problem with some data. This is what we will do in, in the afternoon. Okay, this was a second example. I expected to spend less time. But uh, okay. So now this is a way of solving the problem. Now let's speak about algorithms. Algorithms to solve the minim this minimization problem. We want to solve minimization theta of f of theta. The first example is called the gradient method. Okay. Again, uh, someone, uh, please uh, raise your hand, the one that heard about the gradient method before. Okay, great. Okay. So the gradient method is theta k plus one. The algorithm is theta k minus tau, the gradient of f of theta k, where tau is small enough. So uh, I forgot to say it, but in optimization, we have to imagine that we are like in a mountain and we want to descend. And you only have to confuse optimization, you only have information about the local, local information, where you are and where is the derivative. But you don't see anything else. You are like, you are, you, yes, you cannot see anything else. Um, so, you have to imagine like this when you minimize. You're at this point and you want to minimize. Okay? So what is doing this is the next point. So you have theta k. The next theta k plus one is something in the direction of the gradient. So the gradient is saying that goes in that direction. And what you are going to do is you're in this point and you will go to this direction. And tau is telling you how much the step, the length. Okay, tau is called line search, but in, in machine learning, it's also called learning rate. Okay. Oh. The first thing is to, to, to see, to, to prove that in fact, doing this will make us descend. Why is the gradient method a descent direction? Because Taylor expansion, f of theta k plus one is equal to f of theta k plus the gradient transposed plus theta k plus one minus theta k plus higher, higher terms, okay? If we say that this 
that we will change the new the new step will be minus so this minus this we will put tau gradient of f so you see here i put minus minus tau gradient of f okay because i select i precisely select this direction then if theta kappa, the Taylor expansion of it will provide us that f theta k okay, plus one is f theta k minus tau gradient of f theta k. And this is positive. And so all of this is negative. So when we have only first order, not second order, when tau is very small, so these terms are the important ones and not the other ones, the other ones are zero, very small, then this is why we put it small enough. Then we say that f theta k plus one is smaller. You see, you subtract something here that is, is negative. So if theta k plus one is smaller than f of theta k. So if you are in theta k and you complete the gradient, <coughs> then the new point will have less value, less value of f. So it's going to be a better point. So you descend, it's a descent direction if tau is small, right? And tau is a parameter that is difficult to, to manage. Let's just speak about this. The second thing we will have to spend about, great, ah, sorry, gradient methods. In machine learning, they, are, instead of gradient method, we use stochastic methods, typically stochastic gradient methods, okay? Which are a version of it. So you average on how the gradient, you don't take the full gradient, and we will speak about this. But just to say, why is this important? Is this is very important because in, in optimization, uh, this is the algorithm that you use. If I mean, most of the time you use this algorithm, a lot of time you use this algorithm. Okay, so C, the first of the condition says that this should be zero. So the algorithm will stop in the optimal. Why? Because you will add zero to the new point. Okay, so it's also consistent. Mm -hmm. It's a steepest lesson. It's called also steepest lesson method. Why? Because we also want to find I will call this theta k plus one. Minus theta k, gradient of theta k. I guess, sorry, increment. It's a bad notation, but because it seems that it's Laplacian, but it's just increment, okay? Such so that the gradient of theta k is more than one. Imagine you want to solve this problem. Solution of this. So if you ask yourself, imagine I have I want to know which direction I use, I have to increment in a way that you you see what you you're going to multiply here is the most you can uh, decrease your equation, your your next point. So for all the possibilities that I can choose here, the one that minimizes the most this, make it smaller, is when I took this parallel to this. So because I, you, you, you can have, so this is this is typical, and you have two vectors, okay, this is one vector and two vectors. If you want to do this very, very small, okay, you have to take the ne negative value of this. So if you want to these two vectors to be very, very small, if you do it orthogonal, it is zero. But you want to be negative very, very much. So you take uh, parallel values of the end. So this, and you will, you will take the, the, contrary, the contrary direction. Okay? We put this because if not, so, so imagine this is gradient of f. For all uh, direction, all all increments that you can use, the one that has less value of this is precisely in the in the in the, in the other direction. 
of course, it's unbounded. As much as you go down, you're going to, this, this scalar product of this value with this vector is going to be uh, smaller. But uh, if you just put a solution to, you, you ask to be bounded, is this, this solution here. So for all the vectors on the gradient, you ask the one half minus gradient of f. So gradient of theta is minus gradient of f. Okay? So you can understand that this, the, all the possible increase or, or change of theta, if you use the gradient method, is the one that will be locally descending the most. So with the, the bound for the tau, it's between one and divided by the, yeah. the, the norm of the direction you're going yes. to. Okay. Yes. Because you want to be normalized by one. It's the same as like Newton direction. This, this direction is the same as Newton? No, this is from the direction. Yes, we will see also this. So you only use first order derivatives. So if you have first order derivative, if you use this, you will be sure that the next point will be smaller than the point that you have. So you just iterate, 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 and maybe it's slow. And this is slow. A slow method. Okay? But you know that at this direction you will uh, decrease the, the function. What does theta here is tau? And what was? What's that theta? This? Tau? Tau is this is the line search or learning rate? I mean, third theta. Uh, this? No, it's a steepest that they said part. Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Is there the state at say? Is it tau? No. I don't know. And I on the direction how far I go, it is tau. Right? And there the state here is also tau. But it's meaning of tau. The thing is that tau, okay, this is sorry, this is not absolute value. Right. So this is a direction, this is a vector. Okay, so you can pre multiply or, or, or so the thing is, you have this direction, okay, and you want to find a direction here. You want to find a direction that minimizes the most this quantity, this, 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 this um, scalar product. So, what you, you find is that the one is, is parallel, but in the other direction is the one that you will be uh, the one that descends the most. How much? If you start uh, being uh, uh, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, of course, you will descend the most. But this is not true because if you do this, um, you are not taking into account the second order. So only with, if tau is small, that is why we bound the direction. Okay, then you can you can you can say that you will descend in the next direction. The length of darkest theta is tau, right? This because this is a this is a vector, so and tau is a, a scalar. Oh, the normal theta is tau. Yes. But tau takes into account the, 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 also the normal the gradient. So it depends on how you pose it. Tau okay, times this. This is exactly the delta theta. Okay. You, you see here, this delta theta, which is exactly this. OK, and a stopping criteria for this is area gradient of f of theta k the norm is more than some value okay i think it's time for a for a Stop a break. Um, it's uh, after 30 minutes, I think. In 11:30, we will use <coughs> uh, other um, other criteria. Are we using the Python now for this part, or just for the Python? Always after uh, lunch break. Okay.
Recording stopped. Gracias. 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 Gracias.